In this film, we'll look at how electric vehicles are charged. We'll have a look at where the energy comes from and how it gets to the vehicle. And we'll answer some questions about what the life cycle emissions are for electric vehicles, because they are, of course, only as clean as the energy that's used to drive them. If we generate our electricity from nuclear or wind or solar, it produces very little CO2 for every unit of electricity that we make. If we use gas, oil or coal, on the other hand, that has a much higher carbon intensity. Of course, in reality, each of these has its limitations, and that means that we have to use a mix of them. The carbon intensity of an electricity grid can vary both during the day and also during the year. So what this means is when you choose to charge your electric vehicle, will influence the carbon benefits that it produces. Typically, we'd like to charge those vehicles overnight when the electricity is greenest and cheapest. Gradually, countries are investing more and more in renewable power. If you look at the UK, for instance, we're the fastest decarbonising of any country in the G20. I am, of course, nerdy enough to have an app on my phone which will show me the grid intensity at any point of the day or night. I had a quick look at it on Sunday, and what you can see here is that only about 15% of the energy on our grid was being generated from non-renewable sources. That was about 3% coal and about 11% from gas. The rest is coming from renewable sources, in particular wind and nuclear. So the good news is if you're driving an electric car today, it's only ever going to get cleaner. What we must do for completeness, of course, is to think about the CO2 generation of every part of a vehicle's life cycle. It's not enough just to think about the electricity that it uses or the fuel it uses on the road. We have to think about the embedded carbon dioxide throughout every stage of the vehicle's life. If you look at a typical conventional vehicle, about a quarter of the life cycle emissions are associated with making the vehicle. The other 75% is associated with the fuel. If we compare that to an electric vehicle, there are a few changes we have to notice. The car body itself takes about the same amount of energy to build as our conventional vehicle. But now we have this additional component of the battery and it has quite a large amount of CO2 embedded in its materials and assembly processes. So most people are surprised to find that as you drive the car out of the showroom, the electric car actually has more embedded CO2 emissions than the conventional one. But of course, over the lifetime of the vehicle, that's more than paid back by the savings from using electricity instead of petrol or diesel as the fuel. So a question that I'm often asked is whether we've got enough power on the grid to be able to provide for all of these electric vehicles. And to answer that question, we have to think about how we use power today. This graph shows the demand for electricity and how it varies during the day, in this case in winter. So what you can see is that overnight, demand is quite low. As we wake up in the morning, the demand increases and it tends to stay fairly level during the day whilst we're at work. And then it rises in the evening as we come home and then drops back down again overnight. If we were to take a million electric vehicles and simultaneously plug them in at about five or six o'clock in the evening when we're right in that peak demand, the amount of energy that they could require would actually challenge our ability to generate electricity in the UK. On the other hand, if we were to take those same million vehicles and charge them overnight, you'll see that it takes place when demand is lower and we can easily accommodate all of those vehicles charging. But where we might have a problem is getting that electricity to where it's needed. In the UK, electricity transmission takes place at two different levels. The first is what we call the national grid, and that takes very large amounts of power and it transmits it through 400 kilovolt lines on the pylons that you might see as you drive along the motorway. So as long as we don't challenge the peak generation capacity, then that grid is easily capable of moving electricity around to charge electric cars, just as it would be for any other purpose. Where things might become more difficult though, is as we step down from the national grid and into the local supply infrastructure in your neighbourhood. So here in the UK, much of our housing stock comes from the 1930s. That means that the substation at the end of your road and the copper cables in the ground are sized to provide about 1.5 kilowatts maximum draw for every house on the street. Your fridge draws about half a kilowatt and your lighting might draw about a tenth of a kilowatt. So providing that is very easy. But if, on the other hand, you drive home and park your electric vehicle on the drive, that might easily draw 7 to 20 kilowatts. If one house on the street does that, it's no big problem. But if all of the houses on the street do it, then you will start to see an overload of the power cables and of the substation. Another area where we could see difficulties will be putting power in place for motorway service stations, because there you might have many vehicles turning up, all wanting to do fast charging simultaneously and that will need connections at the scale of megawatts rather than kilowatts. So if we think about our typical electric passenger car with a range of about 150 miles, there's a number of different ways we can think about charging that. The first is that I could plug it into my three pin plug at home. 
and that'll provide about three kilowatts. That's enough to be able to charge that 150 mile battery in about 12 hours overnight. But there are ways we could do it faster. So the next step we would look at would be to use what's called a fast charger. You might find one of those in your workplace or a supermarket, or you could have one installed at home, and that can charge the battery at between 7 and 22 kilowatts. That's enough to be able to charge that 150 mile of battery in as little as an hour and a half. Our next step to move faster is to use a rapid charger. These are DC chargers, and they go at anything from 50 to 120 kilowatts. You'll typically find these in a motorway service station and they could charge that 150 mile battery in as little as 18 minutes. We'd like this to be much faster. So we're currently looking at systems that could charge it up to 350 kilowatts. That would potentially charge your battery in just five or six minutes. And we think that would be hugely attractive for improving mass market uptake of electric vehicles. So what does all this mean? First thing, driving an electric vehicle is good for the environment and it only gets better in the future as our electricity grid gets cleaner. To put the infrastructure in place to be able to charge millions of vehicles is going to take time and investment. As you see more and more charging points, you won't need to buy a car with a huge electric range and a large expensive battery in it. We hope that you'll be able to stop at a service station, charge the battery in as little as five minutes and drive away again. The technologies we have around us today are good enough to meet the needs of a reasonable number of electric vehicle users, but not everybody yet. Research is improving the situation. The batteries are taking less energy to build, the grid is becoming cleaner, we're able to charge vehicles much faster, and we'll be rolling out charging infrastructure which supports large numbers of vehicles more easily. If we want to realise the full environmental benefits we can see from electrification, it's vital that we continue research that will make the products cheaper, more accessible and more convenient to use. I hope you've enjoyed these films. If you'd like to learn more about the cutting edge research we're doing at WMG, please check out our website or search batteries at WMG.